Yu-Gi-Oh! is such a fantastic franchise that has brought so much joy to people all over the world, whether that's from the anime, the card game, the manga, or even the action figures. The biggest thing it has brought together is a massive community of people who can share in their love of the franchise. Recently, I started up a series of videos that go through the Generation 1 era of Yu-Gi-Oh! So essentially, anything that deals with yu gi Moto along with his friends on their adventures. This trip down memory lane is filled with a lot of great moments flooding back in after so long from my obsession with all things Yu-Gi-Oh! growing up and I hope for you it can provide that as well. Today, we are continuing on our journey through the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! where last time we looked into the origins of the series, which were a lot darker and less what Yu-Gi-Oh! would be most known for, to going through all of Season 1, which would consist of the Duelist Kingdom arc of the franchise. For this part, we are going to discuss Season 2 of Yu-Gi-Oh! which kicks off the Battle City arc, bringing in a larger threat for Yu-Gi and his friends to deal with, a massive citywide dueling tournament, and even the Egyptian god cards. There's a whole lot here that is really fun to explore, it's some of my favorite bits from the franchise as a whole, and I know for many others it is as well. Each part in this series can be viewed standalone and viewed as one big series. But with that said, welcome to the puzzling world of Yu-Gi-Oh! Part 2. We continue on with our characters after Duelist Kingdom and dealing with both the Big Five for Kaiba and Duke with the whole dungeon dice monsters thing. Days are going by like usual now with Yugi and friends still dealing with stuff like school, and Yugi, heeding the warnings from Shadi from the end of the last season, switches out his Millennium Puzzle necklace rope for a tougher chain to hold it up. But with all of the uncertainty in the air about the threats that are coming, Yugi gets stopped on his way to school by a mysterious person who offers him a fortune telling regarding his future, foolishly handing this person the Millennium Puzzle when he asked for a personal item to help with the reading. As soon as the stranger gets his hands on the Millennium Puzzle, he runs off as Yugi gets led to a setup area that he knows is clearly a trap of some sort. While this is happening, Bakura and the evil spirit that still has a hold over him get word from Teya about Yugi having to deal with the puzzle getting stolen, leaving Bakura to try and find Yugi on his own for the sake of getting the puzzle for himself, rearranging the way the trap led Yugi to hold off his other friends from directly finding him for now. Yugi's trap, however, turned out to be a dueling area that gets explained to him as a duel for the sake of the puzzle. If he wants it back, he has to defeat this mysterious cloaked person. The biggest problem with the duel is Yugi playing as himself without the backing of the pharaoh to work with. As the battle begins and they start going back and forth, Yugi starts realizing the familiarity to the cards being played, figuring out that this mysterious person is none other than Bandit Keith, calling him out as the stranger reveals this to be true, but also not true at the same time. While it's the body and even the deck of Bandit Keith, he appears to be under some sort of control as someone is using him as a vessel to get to Yugi, bringing the presence of another Millennium Item into play for this to happen. Yugi starts building up a good defense against Keith's strategies though, which also include his signature cheating ways, and in the meantime, Bakura has tracked down where Yugi has been brought while Joey, Tristan, and Teya are trying to navigate the path to where Yugi is thanks to Bakura's meddling of that path to follow. Thanks to Keith's cheating, he is able to summon Zara the Mant, a powerful monster that Yugi is struggling to figure out how to defeat, knowing he has no singular creature in his deck that can face Zara head on, buying time until he figures out what to do, placing monster after monster in defense mode to protect his life points for a bit. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! When Bakura arrives to see that this is happening, he notices there is some bond between the third party and Bandit Keith through the power of another Millennium Item and proceeds to break it. But this struggle results in the puzzle being smashed back into multiple pieces as Keith sets fire to the building, leaving Yugi struggling to put the puzzle back together and not leave without it. And his friends come around to help out, saving a passed out Yugi who wouldn't leave without the puzzle as well as making sure they could save the puzzle for Yugi. As Yugi then starts healing up at the hospital, he fears what is coming his way. The game has changed and some new mysterious presence wants the puzzle as well, putting him in severe danger for it. Yugi puts back together his puzzle and everything is all good, but another character gets introduced into the series named Ishizu, who has a Millennium Item of her own, the Millennium Necklace. She asks Kaiba to meet her at the museum, showing him a special tablet that explains more of the past and part of the role Kaiba is going to play in the series. The biggest thing he learns here are about the Egyptian God cards, the type of cards that sound perfect for him to have in order to not only be an unstoppable duelist, but 
to beat Yugi once and for all. In fact, she has one of them on her, Obelisk the Tormentor, giving it to Kaiba and telling him to assemble together all three of them, needing the other two of Slifer the Sky Dragon and the Winged Dragon of Ra. The way to bring those cards out of hiding is for him to create a tournament, one the likes that no one has ever seen before in the dual monster scene. The deal for him to have the card is that he will have to return it once the tournament is over, but he has other plans to keep the card for himself, because of course he does, he's Kaiba. The other god cards are in the hands of a group called the Rare Hunters, a secret group of powerful duelists that essentially run a black market full of some of the strongest and rarest cards out there. Kaiba now gets to work developing what this tournament would be to set all of the plans in motion. In the meantime, Teya starts trying to help Yugi and Yami uncover more of the blurry past of Yami's history to start connecting all the dots. But the only distraction to stop this is of course an impromptu dance dance revolution battle with a guy named Johnny Steps. And then Yugi duels him afterwards, but it's nice to see the bonding of Teya and Yugi some more. Once they themselves get to the museum and start looking through the tablets depicting moments of what happened in the past, they are taken aback when seeing a pharaoh facing off against a priest that resembles both Yugi and Kaiba. Luckily, our museum guide Ashizu reappears as a member of those who protect the memory of the pharaoh. There is a chance for Yami to be granted his memories back, but that would require the gathering of the seven millennium items. She is very cryptic in her responses to Yami, and he questions her placement in all of this, but she only forewarns of a new enemy that will confront Yami that possesses a millennium item, and the battles of fate and destiny will soon be knocking on his doorstep. Kaiba's been busy though, putting together the newest version of the dual disc technology he's been working on, and begins constructing a new deck that is more powerful than his last, testing the strength of his new Egyptian god card as it proves to be so powerful that it starts breaking the machines and systems running his simulation. Then, as Yugi and Teya are still out and about, they start running into and seeing a bunch of top tier duelists from Duelist Kingdom, along with even more powerful duelists we haven't met yet gathering around the city. Things seem odd that they all have gathered here, but then Kaiba takes over all of the screens available in the city and announces a brand new tournament, the Battle City Tournament. And in one week, it'll officially begin. All participants are required to wear and use his new mobile dueling disc system, and now the duelist's rarest cards are on the line in each duel, with the loser having to give theirs up to the winner. The mysterious new villain in the shadows is ready for whatever this tournament holds, possessing the Millennium Rod and having his rare hunters go out and do his bidding within the tournament. This moment was so exciting and pivotal for the series, changing the game and making Duelist Kingdom seem like the appetizer to the meal we are about to dig into. Of course, Joey catches wind about this and is excited about it, but come registration, his ranking as a duelist is too low, mainly because of the dislike Kaiba has for him, but luckily, and unluckily, the person running the registration for Joey notices that the rarest card Joey has is the Red Eyes Black Dragon, and this person has ties to the rare hunters, so to make Joey easy pickings to get the card off him, Joey's rankings get switched around to where he could qualify for the tournament and officially gives both Yugi and Joey their own duel discs, making a call after they leave to alert the rare hunters. Joey is pretty excited to be in the tournament, but takes a moment to go and check up on his sister Serenity at the hospital, as she is preparing for her now afforded eye operation. But along the way, Joey is confronted by a group of rare hunters, and he is forced into a duel as they are wasting no time in trying to acquire his Red Eyes Black Dragon. As the duel goes on, Joey meets a surprise he wasn't expecting, as the rare hunter was able to bide enough time to pull the five pieces of Exodia out, immediately winning the duel. He then reveals that he has multiple sets of Exodia in his deck to aid in his chances of pulling all the pieces needed. The rare hunters proceed to jump Joey and take his red eyes from him, and the next day, Yugi is informed that Joey never made it to the hospital to visit his sister after he separated from the group, causing them all to now go out and look for him as we get a moment between Tristan and Joey as he finds Joey first and tries to talk some sense into him as he felt he couldn't face his sister as he has been the one trying to build up her confidence and going through with the scary operation, and if he himself wasn't confident anymore, it could carry on to her, at least that's what he thinks. Tristan gets him to the hospital and now, more than ever, Joey is ready and confident in getting his red eyes back and giving it all he's got. Now, the start of the tournament officially happens and Joey wastes no time in spotting the rare hunter who took his red eyes black dragon, whose name is Seeker, and he immediately challenges him to a duel, but he's interested in Yugi and his dark magician. So Yugi jumps in to take the battle and demands that if he wins, Seeker will give the red eyes back to Joey rather than get a card for himself. Joey tries to warn Yugi of the tactics with Exodia, but Seeker stops him from doing so, threatening to destroy his red eyes if he spoils the surprises in store. Behind the scenes, Kaiba is playing his own version of God, watching over the city and all the duels taking place, now focusing in on Yugi's duel as they see that this rare hunter was illegally entered into the tournament through some hacking as Mokubo wants to go and disqualify him from the tournament. But Kaiba stops him, wanting to not only study more of how Yugi duels and handles himself, but wants to see the other Egyptian god cards pop up from the 
the rare hunters, allowing the battle to continue. As the duel rages on, Yugi quickly learns that Seeker is trying to pull together the pieces of Exodia, as he now has to figure out how to deal with that, successfully finding a way to defeat Seeker by using Chain Destruction to take out all of the head cards of Exodia from his deck, allowing him to play without the threat of Exodia one-shotting him. Afterwards, Yugi destroys Seeker's cards based on him using them to cheat by having a special invisible ink on them, which is one of the many small differences between the Japanese version and the English dub, as in the Japanese version the cards were actually fake, and that's why Yugi ends up destroying him. I figured I'd bring that up since there are a lot of small adjustments here and there that result in the same thing but told slightly different, but I am going through this with the perspective I grew up with the show and experienced it, so I may not be calling out many differences like this, but I thought it was worth noting for those who experienced it differently and are wondering why there is a difference here at all. Yugi also gets the Red Eyes Black Dragon back for Joey, and then he gets to speak with Merrick for the first time, the one who wields the Millennium Rod and uses his powers to possess Seeker to either control him or speak through him as a vessel. Merrick refers to Yugi or Yami as the Pharaoh, having some sort of connection to the past or knowledge of the past as well. Merrick reveals his plans of becoming Pharaoh himself after taking Yugi's Millennium Puzzle and gathering together the three Egyptian god cards for himself, really spicing up the plot for where the series goes from here. Also, Merrick is like my favorite character in all of Yu-Gi-Oh, so I really love the Battle City arc of Yu-Gi-Oh specifically for that reason. After this, when Yugi tries to give Joey back his card, he refuses, telling Yugi he won it fair and square and if he is going to become a better duelist, the best he can be, he needs to do things properly, learn his lessons in dueling and become strong without relying on one card to pull through for him. Together, the Yujo friendship bond is stronger than ever, as no matter what, they will find a way to take Merrick down in any shape or form he decides to show up. It's all very wholesome. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh! returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! As the tournament continues on, Joey is eager to start proving himself to be a stronger duelist, catching the ending of a duel where a new duelist to the series named Espa defeats Rex. Espa is shown to, or at least claims to have psychic powers, but not like Millennium Item type powers, just like real, I say that with air quotes, psychic powers. Espa calls out Joey to a duel next, being one of the few to initially show him respect as the runner-up from Duelist Kingdom, and of course, Joey accepts. This duel won't just be big for Joey, but also special for his sister, who Tristan goes to visit and watches the battle online to let Serenity know how her brother is doing while she can't see. Now, the rules for Battle City dueling are initially changed from how it was before during Duelist Kingdom, and now is the best place to get into that since Joey struggles with not knowing the new rules, like having to tribute or sacrifice other monsters to be able to summon higher level monsters based on the amount of stars on the top of the card. So gone are just summoning monsters willy-nilly. Now you can summon level 4 and under cards, but after this, certain levels require more sacrifices, like level 5 and 6 monsters require requiring a sacrifice of one monster from the field and beyond that for something like a level 7 requiring two monsters, allowing the mechanics of the game to play out drastically different and become the standard format for how the game is played from this point. Also, for life points in the game, it has changed from 2,000 at the start to 4,000, making for duels that can be more exciting and potentially drawn out just a bit longer. Back to the duel itself as Joey is struggling to get past the use of psychic abilities, Yugi is watching from above without interfering with Joey directly, but does notice the truth about Espa, seeing that he isn't psychic after all, but instead he has brothers spying on Joey from above as well. They are directly able to see Joey's cards and they report to Espa what he draws and has to use for the match. Yugi doesn't interfere though, only watching for now, but while they are reporting in on the cards he's drawing, they mistake one of them as another similar card, leading to Espa calling out the wrong card that Joey had just pulled, which clues him into something being up with the whole psychic abilities thing. The brothers thought Joey had pulled the card Graceful Dice when he had really pulled Skull Dice, allowing Espa to think that Joey plays two Graceful Dice, when really it was a trick for him to fall into, as he plays both a Graceful Dice and Skull Dice at the same time, and Joey had figured out how he is cheating through his so-called psychic powers, as somehow he is seeing his hand. Which we should all give it up to Joey for figuring out the base of what's happening to help him get back in the duel. Rex then also realizes through this duel that he was robbed of a fair duel against Espa beforehand. When Mokuba learns about this though, he's not playing around with how he's helping watch over and run the the tournament, confronting the spying brothers and is ready to officially disqualify Espa, but the brothers explain an orphan backstory that touches Mokuba's heart based on a similar experience he has from the past with Kaiba, and their whole family situation, but that will be explored later on at another point. Because of this, Mokuba allows Espa to continue on, minus the cheating as Joey and Espa continue on down below. With Yugi still watching from above and being proud of Joey, Mokuba feels that Yugi would have given the brothers a second chance and wouldn't condemn Espa from dueling. It's a nice moment 
moment seeing how Mokuba views Yugi and kind of looks up to him in a way as well. Through this duel, Espa brings out a powerful new card that Joey has to overcome called Jinzo, but he really starts relying on strategies through his spell and trap cards more so than he ever has before. Not just like he was at the start of Season 1, only having monsters and trying to rely on power. And with these strategies and leaving a bit of it up to chance by having faith in himself, Joey ends up winning the duel, getting Espa's Jinzo as this becomes a new powerful card for Joey to get attached to, and a locator card, which these all add up in gathering the pieces of where the finals would be taking place for the top players. Espa may have lost the duel, but at least he still has his brothers, and he promises to not cheat again for any duels that he has. Speaking of brothers, Mokuba's not the only one being super involved here. As Kaiba tests the might of his Egyptian god card, getting involved in a duel once he challenges another duelist, who was picking on another just to prove a point that the other duelist's actions were not okay in the slightest, but also really just to get a nice field test of Obelisk. But thanks to the use of the Egyptian god card, Merrick is fully alerted to the presence of Obelisk the Tormentor, and starts tracking down Kaiba as we get a bit of history, showing how Merrick was involved in getting two of the three Egyptian god cards, and revealing that Ishizu had the other, and is also his sister, which is a cool reveal and pretty fun for the characters being in relation to each other. Yugi at the same time is enticed to enter into a circus tent that turns into another trap, bringing him underground as the camera feeds for the battles couldn't be viewed anymore, with his new opponent revealing himself as Arcana, a duelist that will also challenge Yugi in new ways thanks to him having his own slightly different Dark Magician card. Of course, he is a member of the Rare Hunters, why wouldn't he be? But the twist for this battle is both of them having their ankles shackled up as the loser of the battle will have a buzzsaw swipe by them to cut off their legs. You know, this type of saw-esque trap mixed with the stuff we've seen so far, and also haven't seen, is really giving me Season Zero vibes, and I'm all here for it. As their battle goes on and we see the Dark Magicians go head-to-head, -head, we learn about Arcane's backstory a little bit and why he's so gung-ho on making this a very serious and life-threatening battle. Talking about his ego and pride being shattered as a once world-famous magician until one of his tricks was messed up, and through this, messing up his face. That's what the point of the mask is. And drove his own fiancé away. He was devastated at what he had done, wanting her back more than anything, as Merrick promised to bring him and his fiancé back together, with him becoming a rare hunter. Even though this whole battle is hidden from the eyes of the tournament, Kaiba is resourceful, tracking where Yugi went through other means, while the others are trying to track him down as well. The next move in the battle is very important to both introducing another powerful and iconic card for Yugi, and iconic card to a whole bunch of fans for the show for a long list of reasons. I'm sure you probably have your own reason if you were there at this moment. And this was Yugi summoning Dark Magician Girl, as she helps Yugi win the battle overall. Arcana had a backup key and tried to free himself from the trap so he wouldn't have to have his legs cut off, but Merrick takes over and is ready to punish Arcana. But Yugi intervenes, getting himself free and then saving Arcana from his fate, as Merrick speaks directly to Yugi through Arcana, warning him of what's to come ahead, with Yugi's friends and family eventually finding him. On Joey's end of things, he ends up getting admired for being the duelist that he is, but a kid tricks him into seeing his duel disc before running off with it. But later, after they catch the thief, the kid talks about the dueling dreams that he had, and that his own cards were stolen by another duelist, with his description alluding to Weevil being the person responsible for this, as Joey furiously heads out to find Weevil. But once the kid is by himself again, he meets up with Weevil, and this was all a plan set up by him, and that he promised the kid a card in return for his help, giving him a common, not-so-great card, which just reminds me of bad trades from back in the day when I was a kid where people would try and make stuff up about crappy cards in the hope that they can get a better card from you. Sorry, that just triggered me a little bit. Joey eventually finds Weevil and challenges him to a duel, as they put up both of their locator cards that they each have as a wager, and this duel has some iconic moments like seeing the effects of Parasite Parasite, with Joey trying to find a way to combat how that card affects him, as the kid from earlier slipped it into Joey's deck, and Weevil is able to use its abilities to actively harm Joey's cards. Later on, Joey gets in worse trouble as Weevil brings out perfectly ultimate Great Moth. As he continues to do what he can to stay in the battle, Weevil continues his onslaught of insects, bringing out the literal queen of them, the Insect Queen, as Joey, not longer, draws upon a powerful card of his own, Gearfried the Iron Knight. Through Joey's strategies, he's able to use Grave Robber, activating the card Eradicating Aerosol, taking out Weevil's Insect Queen as Gearfried can make a final blow and defeat Weevil. So now he has even more locator cards for himself and a sense of how good he has become as a duelist, defeating Weevil all on his own. As for where Yugi is at, he gets challenged to a duel by the character named Strings, who in fact does have strings on him, being controlled by Merrick as his own mind puppet. And here's where we really get into some intense stuff, as not only does he have some powerful and unique cards in his deck like Revival Jam, and we see Yugi getting to use another staple card of this generation, Buster Blader, but as their battle 
battle gets more intense, trapping Yugi in a perilous situation, Strings brings out an Egyptian god card, Slifer the Sky Dragon, aka my favorite of the three Egyptian god cards. This double fringe miss is brought to you by Gamersubs. And why don't you hit that link down below and go over to Gamersubs, pick yourself out something nice, Use code FRENCH, get 10% off. Yugi tries to hold his own as Slifer only continues to grow more powerful throughout and takes out Yugi's top hitter cards. There's not much that Yugi can do with strategy alone through his cards. Figuring out the only way to defeat Strings and Slifer is to create a loop of using brain control to take over the use of Revival Jam and constantly using the effect of the card's safe return to keep this going, eventually causing Strings to keep drawing cards from his deck until, uh-oh, he decks out, forcing Strings to lose the duel and leaving Slifer defeated on a tech technicality. This was in part to show a way to defeat an Egyptian god card, but also to show how powerful one can be in full display of its might. From this battle, Yugi now becomes the owner of Slifer the Sky Dragon, taking the card away from Merrick's control as Kaiba was fascinated to witness the duel himself, and wants an immediate duel with Yugi right then and there. But Merrick speaks through strings and warns them that he is on his way to the city personally and is after Yugi's friends now, to turn them into mind puppets like strings, and the other rare hunters, really threatening the core of Yugi's life, his group of friends. Yugi stops his interactions with Kaiba for the duel he wanted in the efforts of going to check in on his friends instead. From this, we get something pretty cool that happens as Yugi and Kaiba end up dueling together as partners when confronted by a pair of rare hunters, while Joey finds himself in a duel against Mako Tsunami for all of the marbles here, having enough locator cards at stake to earn entrance into the finals. But another team up is brewing in the background as Merrick ends up meeting with Bakura, the evil form of Bakura of course, striking a deal to work together for their common and personal goals that they have. This is why the Battle City arc is so much fun. Awesome villains, great team-ups, insane battles, and more. Joey's battle ends up going well in his favor by the end of it, being able to defeat Mako in an intense duel, earning himself the locator cards and getting two powerful cards from Mako, Fortress Whale and the Legendary Fisherman. For Yuki and Kaiba, their stakes for the duel with the rare hunters is taking place on top of a high glass floor, with the threat of the losers falling through the glass when they lose their life points and would fall into a special portal to the Shadow Realm. At the same time, both Joey and Taya, along with Mokuba, are captured by other rare hunters as Merrick is already trying to enact his plan of capturing Yugi's friends and Kaiba's brother. As the double battle rages on, the rare hunters are able to ritual summon the powerful beast known as the Masked Beast, but Yugi secretly had a special effect from his card, Beast of Gilfer, affecting the Masked Beast, allowing Kaiba, who Monster Reborn summons his Blue Eyes White Dragon to the field, in order for it to attack the Masked Beast, whose attack points were now lowered and left it open to be defeated. What a fun pairing of characters to see work together with actual and meaningful strategies. It genuinely is such a fun moment. But the Masked Beast saga isn't over, as eventually they are able to summon Masked Beast Desgardius, who is even more powerful. Back with Merrick and the hostages, Joey becomes the main target for Merrick's control, all the while his sister Serenity is able to finally take her bandages off to see the results of the surgery and hopefully have her eyesight, but has to wait until it gets darker outside for when she does it. All of these events are starting to come together ramping up to what I feel is the most standout moment from the series that we will get to here shortly. Tristan ends up going to pick up Serenity, as the first thing she wants to be able to see is her brother, as they head back to where the battles are taking place. But now, Taya is under the possession of Merrick as well, with Mokuba being able to escape. For now, Yugi and Kaiba end up winning their duel, with the one-two punch of Valkyrion the Magna Warrior and Obelisk the Tormentor, defeating one of the rare hunters as the other forfeits when he sees what Merrick does to them, but they both just end up getting dealt with by Merrick. Yugi and Kaiba win and head towards the others. They also end up running into Mokuba as the three of them head in a chopper towards where Joey and Taya are being held, as Yugi informs Kaiba of what's going on here with the use of the Millennium Items, and that he is in fact the Pharaoh, making Kaiba realize that what he was told earlier in the season at the museum was more than just a story, but he is still not fully believing in the magical powers of the Millennium Items. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh! returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Upon arriving to the location where Joey and Taya are, a brand new and deadlier game is about to be played as we get into the most notable point of Battle City, at least for me, and that's the forced battle that Merrick has a controlled Joey do against Yugi. And per the conditions of Yugi not using Slifer in this duel, as both of them are attached to a chain that leads to a ship anchor suspended in the air above their battle and pointing down below into the depths of the water, where the loser of the battle will not be unlocked from his chain and dragged to the bottom of the ocean. Yugi instead swaps in 
in his red eyes black dragon that he's been holding for Joey as a potential way to help break through at one point to save his friend. Taya's mind control wears off, but is trapped waiting under a suspended crate that if anyone tries to stop the duel or save their friends, will crush her. Merrick also catches wind of Yugi's other friend Tristan, who is on his way with Serenity, and figured capturing them as well would be more intense for his overall plans, sending out his rare hunters to intercept them, but Duke Devlin from Dungeon Dice Monsters fame comes in to help them for now. As the duel is going on, Yugi tries to battle not as Yami to help out in the situation, and Merrick originally wanted to battle the Pharaoh, but realizes that it would probably be much easier to just deal and defeat regular Yugi in general. Through the use of Yugi just being the regular old Yugi and using Red Eyes Black Dragon, Joey starts having the shakeup in his head to become himself a bit, but the control here is too strong for Joey to fully break free. Mai shows up to then help Tristan, Duke, and Serenity get to where Joey and everyone else is, as they see what is actually going on between Yugi and Joey as the emotional stakes between the two get higher, with Yugi trying to keep pushing through to Joey, while Merrick's control over him has it feel a lot more one-sided in Joey's favor. Once Joey draws the card Meteor of Destruction, as Merrick is trying to control Joey to use it to defeat Yugi, Joey pushes back from this as he recalls his friendship with Yugi, showing how powerful their bond is for Joey to fight back against Merrick's control here. Yugi clashes with Merrick and tells him to stop being a coward and come face him for real in a duel rather than using puppets to do his bidding, as all this does is anger Merrick to use way more force in controlling Joey, reclaiming his mind completely, activating Meteor of Destruction as it comes barreling towards Yugi. But Joey's willpower is proven to be way too strong as he completely breaks free from Merrick's control, separating Merrick from his mind and fully coming to his senses. Yugi then intercepts the Meteor with another card that can either redirect the attack back at Joey or allow it to continue to hit him. And in not wanting to hurt Joey and save him, he lets the Meteor continue to come after him, taking the guilt away from Joey for using the card in the first place. This takes Yugi's life points to zero while the shackle key is unlocked for Joey. But in a quick bit of thinking, Joey wants to save Yugi by then activating the other effect that the Meteor of Destruction has, forcing one of Yugi's monsters to attack, sending in Red Eyes to finish off the rest of his own life points to open up the key box for Yugi. And we don't have time to talk about how the duel should have technically been over and how this move couldn't have happened, but emotional semantics here, okay? As Joey gets to Yugi's key to help him while he's passed out, the anchor is unlocked and starts dragging both of them to the bottom of the ocean. But Joey never got his key to unlock himself, as he saves Yugi but continues to sink to the bottom saying that Yugi is the best friend that a guy could ask for. Serenity, who takes off her bandages at one point to finally see her brother duel, comes rushing in with the key for him to swim down to Joey and save her brother. In the end, Joey and Yugi are all good and even when Joey feels sorry for himself getting in this situation, Mai comes to him to snap some sense into him, along with Tristan, seeing that his courage inspired Serenity to make it through her operation and then be brave enough to go and save him. It's all very emotional and sweet and the episode with the most heart. Even Yugi gets a nice moment to thank Yami for trusting him with handling this battle, and even then Yugi thanks Kaiba for his help in this, with Kaiba telling Yugi that he did what he had to do and he will see him at the finals. It's peak, the most memorable set of episodes in the Battle City arc, or just in the series in general in my opinion. In the meantime, before we get to the finals, we see that Merrick is now focused on the Battle City finals, to make the next step in his plans here, as Yami Bakura is convinced to enter the finals as well, stealing what he needs to get into it, and then getting into a battle with Bones, who we haven't dealt with since the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh, and dueling him in the Shadow Realm to get the locator cards needed to be in the finals. To find the location of said finals for Yugi and Joey, they place the locator cards across a dual disc in the proper slots that now turn into the instructions of where to go as they all head to where the big finale is going to take place. Or will it be really drawn out for a long time from here? Who knows? Before we get to start off the finals, Mai finds herself dealing with Magnum, a character that wants to marry her and demands that if he wins a duel, that he will take her place in the finals and she will have to marry him. Luckily, she ends up winning, but as he tries to take her away forcefully, Joey steps in to save her, furthering the connection that Mai and Joey have built up for each other. But now, all of the finalists show up to the secret location with Merrick making his entrance as the character of Namu, to be in disguise while his brother Odeon takes the identity of Merrick. Bakura shows up, surprising the others as well. From there, we see all of the final duels will take place on the Kaiba Blimp, which this was made into a toy. It came with a special blue translucent obelisk the Tormentor action figure, and I still have it to this day. I love it. Things get going really quick here as the time on the blimp initially gets Yami Bakura to be exposed immediately with the first matchup going against Yugi. The duels will take place on the main dueling space on top of the blimp, so thanks for always doing the most to be over the top, Kaiba. You're appreciated. Yami Yugi can sense that Yami Bakura is just operating in plain sight. Calling this fact out and Yami Bakura 
represents himself fully as their battle starts the finals off. At first, Yugi seems to be confidently taking control of the duel, but when Bakura begins his plans to use Destiny Board, things get a lot tougher as this creates a countdown as every turn will pull out another letter to fully spell final. Once that happens, Bakura essentially wins the duel. Merrick and Bakura are two different types of evil in how they operate, and even if they are supposed to tentatively work together, there is already division between them when Bakura refuses Merrick's advice in general. But why would he need the advice, you know? His destiny board is already on the fourth letter being spelled out, and Yugi has to win right away or else he will lose the duel now. Luckily, Yugi ends up summoning the first Egyptian god card of the finals, with Slifer the Sky Dragon coming out to play. But before he makes any decision, the mind games continue with the real Bakura breaking through to Yugi for help, and is clearly not in the know of where they are and what's going on, as Merrick and his brother Odeon continue to mess with the situation. Yami Bakura sees that he's been played like a pawn to Merrick, and needs Bakura to stay alive for him to have a real host body to live in, forcing full control and letting Yugi defeat him in the duel at the risk of going into a coma to survive and save them both, which is exactly what happens. But what happened to the Millennium Ring in the end? Well, here's the surprise for you. Teya is still technically under the control of Merrick, reconnecting to her to have her take the ring for the time being. With Bakura in a coma now, Kaiba refuses to land the ship and allows a medical team to take care of him in the time being, thanks to Serenity backing up Joey's demands of helping Bakura. Shadi ends up returning to visit Yugi and reveals that all seven of the Millennium items are on board the blimp right now, along with the three Egyptian god cards, making up all the right circumstances for the spirit of the pharaoh to unlock his full slate of memories. The only thing that he would need to do is win the tournament. Yeah, just a small little task. We also get some dual monsters history here as we learn about Pegasus's full story of his travels to Egypt and how the card game came to be. This also includes the origin of the production of the god cards themselves and why they are so sought after by nefarious individuals after Pegasus had them sealed away for the protection of the world itself. Just a fun bit of lore being sprinkled into this episode. But now it's time for the next duel to get going as it's randomly selected that Joey will go up against Merrick, or at least Odeon disguised as Merrick. Joey's excited to get revenge on Merrick for the mind control stuff, but even he isn't prepared for how dangerous this duel is going to be. Joey is still dueling here without his red eyes black dragon as Yugi confirms that he hadn't taken it back. But with all of the powerful new cards that he has won from high level duelists, he tries to give it his all without relying on one signature card. What Kaiba knows that the others don't is that there is a potential of us witnessing the power of the winged dragon of Ra, the third and final god card yet to make an appearance, as Kaiba is eagerly awaiting to see it be used, and more specifically for his own enjoyment on Joey. The duel itself is extremely intense towards Joey, but he isn't giving up without giving it his all. We start to see some flashbacks from Odeon and how he is connected to everything with Merrick, as in the duel he ends up pulling the winged dragon of Ra, but surprise, this is a fake repro of it that Merrick had put in his deck to help keep up the facade for now, but Odeon is worried about actually playing it for what the repercussions might be, but Merrick tells him to play the fake Egyptian god card anyway. Despite this intense moment that could be happening, we go further into the flashbacks of the Ishtars, showing how Odeon was adopted into the family and how the birth of Ashizu and Merrick came to be, as well as the deep connection and loyalty of Merrick and Odeon coming together, why they are covered in tattoos and it paints Merrick in a way different light than the one we see now. By that, I mean the real evil side of Merrick, not the seemingly nice-natured Namu. Back within the duel itself, Joey calls out Odeon for how he's playing, claiming that this isn't the real Merrick at all, and Kaiba disagrees with this, but Yugi backs him up. So the duel continues anyway, and Odeon can defeat Joey without any show of force from the Winged Dragon of Ra, but Merrick wants Odeon to play it to keep up the disguise for longer. Now we get to see why having a counterfeit Egyptian card is nothing to play around with, as once the fake Winged Dragon of Ra is summoned, the wrath of the real god comes out, with a lightning strike being sent directly to Odeon and knocking him out, destroying the fake Millennium Rod he had in his possession, and proving that he wasn't the real Merrick after all. Joey is also hit by lightning as a result of what's going on, leaving both duelists unconscious, as Kaiba just loves being Kaiba, seeing that the life points on both sides are at a standstill, matching each other's, that the first person to wake back up and stand up wins the duel. Thanks to all of Joey's friends within his dream, he is encouraged to stand back up, eventually doing so and winning the duel. Odeon soon reveals the truth to Joey before passing out further, explaining who the real Merrick is in the efforts of just wanting who Merrick used to be back when they were younger, as this causes the real Merrick to snap, with Yami Merrick fully coming out to play. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh!
Then we see Joey miss shooting his shot with Mai, as when she asked if she was in his dream that he had that woke him up to win the duel, he declines out of being flustered, and she feels that Joey doesn't perhaps care about her like she cares about him. Now it's her time to battle anyway, as she goes up against Merrick, which could be bad to see the might of the real Merrick on full display. It even starts out pretty deadly as well, with Merrick taking the duel to the Shadow Realm immediately, with Yugi warning Mai of how dangerous this could be. But in her state of confidence, as well as feeling a bit hurt from Joey earlier, she disregards this and just wants to duel. But there's another component here that really starts to affect Mai, and that is she loses bits of her memory as her monsters are destroyed, starting off with losing her memories of who Taya is. But this also works the other way as well, as Merrick would start to lose his memories of others like some of his rare hunter buddies, while Mai ends up losing her memories about Joey as this goes on. This also gets us to learn more about Mai, how she became a duelist and a bit of a loner, having to move house a lot with her family, forging a real bond with her cards instead of people. Yugi tries to reach out to Mai through the Millennium Puzzle to keep her engaged in the duel and to do what she can to win. This leads her to use the effects of her Amazon Chainmaster to give up some life points, but then to take one card from Merrick's hand and put it in her hand, that card being the real Winged Dragon of Ra. Not long later, Mai summons the Winged Dragon of Ra, which is shocking in general to see, but for some reason, it summons it in a sphere, as the only way that it can truly be activated to come out of this is through being able to read the ancient text written on the card. Merrick is not worried knowing that she can't use the full force of Ra even if she tried. He then chains Mai up to keep her from moving, then begins speaking the ancient text to take control of the Winged Dragon of Ra for himself, aiming the power of this directly at her as Joey runs up to try and help Mai remember who he is and that he does care as he wants to save her. And this ends up working for her memories at the moment, and even Yugi tries to get up there as well to protect Mai. But the Winged Dragon of Ra defeats her in the duel as Merrick for now sends her to the Shadow Realm. As time ticks on, as she slowly will continue to lose the memory of everyone in her mind. And wow, all of these battles are resulting in non-stop casualties. I know Kaiba has really good insurance here, but if waivers weren't signed, I smell a few lawsuits coming. From there, the next battle, the last of the quarterfinals, begins as Kaiba ends up dueling Ishizu. And much like Pegasus, her Millennium Necklace helps her predict Kaiba's moves for the duel. After so many turns, Kaiba ends up drawing Obelisk the Tormentor, but Merrick's Millennium Rod gets to him, convincing Kaiba through visions of the past that the only way to defeat her is to use his Blue Eyes White Dragon. Through the strategy of disregarding Obelisk in favor of using Blue Eyes results in him winning the battle and setting up the roster of the final duelist who made it past the quarterfinals. The episode that follows this is the cooldown episode that will get us more into the lore and give us a breather between the intense multi-episode long duels that have been happening in succession. Like for Kaiba, he realizes that he can understand and read the ancient text on the Winged Dragon of Ra as he looks into that. Ashizu sits with the others and explains more about her and her family's past, leading to a flashback of it all. The Ishtars themselves are supposed to be the guardians of the Millennium Items and live in secret underground. We see how the Pharaoh's memories are carried through the different generations and how that ended up with Merrick. We also see how different and good-natured Merrick once was and how he was rebellious towards his forced family traditions and ceremonies, wanting to break the rules and go outside even though it is forbidden. We see how Odeon was treated by their father as he would be punished for anything Merrick would do, but would take it in stride out of the respect and loyalty he has for Merrick. We see how Yami Merrick first comes to be as well, as it was in the protection of Odeon from his father, sending him to the Shadow Realm as we see the kind-hearted Merrick regain control of himself, having no clue of what just happened as he sees his dead father before him. Shadi then appears to explain that this was all due to the Pharaoh's revival, which is easy to see why Merrick is coming for Yugi and how the evil inside of Merrick with Yami Merrick has grown so strong. Shizu explains that now in the present, they're the only ones that have a chance at saving Merrick here from the darkness taking over him. Joey refuses to do so for everything that Merrick has already done to him and his friends. He's very against forgiving and helping him. The Shizu leaves Yugi with the Millennium Necklace, reminding him that he still needs the five other Millennium items along with the God cards to get the full range of the Pharaoh's memories back. Taya privately asks her what happens when all of the items return to their tomb, as the Shizu then states that every soul has one place to return to. Taya is then taken control of once again, being forced to bring the Millennium Ring back to Bakura, who now wakes up right away. At the same time, Yugi and Yami Yugi are speaking about what happens in the end of all of this as Yugi knows that their time together isn't forever, and that there will come a time that they part ways, but he knows his responsibilities that he carries as the vessel for the Pharaoh to use. Yami Bakura confronts Yami Merrick as a wager is set up for the battle of their Millennium Items, as they find themselves getting into a shadow game. In this duel, the good Merrick is with Bakura, while Yami Merrick has full control of Merrick's mind and body. As the battle goes on, Bakura ends up using exchange to get the Winged Dragon of Ra into his hand. We also see in this shadow game,
game, the less life points that you have, the more of your body begins to disappear. And with Merrick holding on to Monster Reborn until Bakura has the Winged Dragon of Ra on his side of the field and eventually gets it into his graveyard, he uses that Monster Reborn to bring it back to his side of the field to defeat Bakura as Bakura leaves him with one final sentence, don't you realize I am the darkness? Foreshadowing something further down the road in the series that isn't important or revealed just yet, but very much will be. Also, Merrick controls Teo once more, helping her get through to his sister about hiding Odeon's body away from Yami Merrick, as we then come to a close for the second season of Yu-Gi-Oh! While the ending of the tournament for the semi-finals and the regular finals are still set to happen, this is where we break for now from what I believe to be the most fun season thanks to how cool it is to see a massive city turned into a duel arena, with so many cool new cards to see, duelists to battle, and a way more intense story that digs way deeper into the lore, with the last handful of episodes since they started the finals really opening up so many cool aspects of the series past, with some incredible character development and setups for all what's about to come next. Plus, Merrick in general is the coolest character out there, just saying. For the next part in the series, we are going to take a look at where Season 3 goes, as the series not only will see the end of the Battle City tournament, but a massive segue from the get-go that introduces a third Kaiba brother. This was seen as a big filler portion of the series as it diverts so heavily from where the show was currently at, rather than just wrapping it up in the efforts of extending the lifespan of the anime. Regardless, that's all dependent on how you feel about that. We will also be taking a look at the first Yu-Gi-Oh! movie, The Pyramid of Light as well, so I hope you enjoy what the next part fully has to offer. Let me know your thoughts on the Battle City arc of the show in the comments below. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.